Please welcome Frank Magisha for an interview on the stage. Can you sit here? Frank Magisha, if you don't mind, perhaps we could start on a, on a personal note. You are very active in your own country. You are a tireless advocate for human rights, for sexual minorities. And this you do risking your own life and your own security. Where does this courage come from? Uh, thank you so much. First of all, thank you to NORAD for inviting me uh, to be part of this very important discussion. Uh, my courage mostly streams from um, the ordinary LGBT persons I meet in Uganda, the stories they tell me. Because when you listen to people's stories, their voices, you want to work very hard and make a change every day. Because when you Think about what everyone is going through. When you remember your own discrimination, you just want to change everything very quickly. And I think for me, what I keep telling people that I barely have time to think about my own safety. I was in Uganda a few months ago, and it, to me, it's kind of, uh, of a big question. How can this old Christian country be so hostile to a group that do nothing wrong except love each other? Uh, Uganda is a very lovely country with very nice people. I think when people ask me why, why all this international attention, I say everyone who has been to Uganda would like to see, um, who, who asks them, them, themselves the question, why are Ugandans acting like this? I think the challenge we're seeing is that we're seeing um, a new wave of extreme conservativeness coming into our country, and not only on LGBT issues, but we are seeing that uh, our government, our politicians are looking at legislating uh, using conservativeness. So I don't know if someone has lied to them that is the way you can have governance or has told them that's the way you can control people because they are bringing up laws. We have an anti-pornography law. We, have, um, we, we had the anti-gay law that was nullified. Then now they are trying to bring up another law yet again. And you can see that Uganda moved from the good strategies of abstaining, be faithful, and condom use, to now saying if you promote condom use, then you're promoting morality. We should only promote abstinence. So you can see that there is a wave, that extreme wave of conservatism. And, and it's all mixed together. Uh, definitely it has been mixed so much into our culture that even us, the very nice, good, loving Ugandans, are not seeing this. So they are just taken by the wave of, if someone, for instance, if you come to Uganda and ask a hundred people, what's your top priorities? No one will talk about homosexuality. But if you ask Ugandans, what do you think about homosexuality? They will say it's the number one problem. So if someone triggers them off, they right away go with the problem. Because it was not originally a society that used to be cruel to, to gay people. That is something new, isn't it? Uh, not at all, uh, because, um, and I'm not talking about many years ago, I'm talking about myself growing up and knowing that there are homosexuals in my neighborhood. You know, I, ca I came out at a very early age. I did not face the level of discrimination that I'm seeing right now. I this bet is something that has increased. It is something that I've, has increased now, yeah. Mm. So where does it come from, this uh, homophobia? Is it, is it an import? Or there, it's a, it is it a Western import? Uh, we are seeing that the wave, the current um, very strong homophobia, of course there were levels of where people you know, did not agree or did not talk about homosexuality in Uganda, but the level whereby if you're known to be homosexual, you're, they will report you to the police. If you're known to be homosexual, the local councils will come and ask about you. If you're known to be homosexual, the landlord will throw you out. You know, this kind of fear has been put into Ugandans by extreme American evangelicals. Hmm. So this is like the, this movie, God Loves Uganda, where, where people traveling into... Can you talk a little more about that? Yes, um, so maybe also to take you back, uh, my organization and myself are suing one of the American evangelical called uh, Scott Lively, who has been so much influential in supporting Ugandan members of parliament in drafting the anti gay law, but also he has been in other countries like Russia, Moldova, and other places in Africa. So uh, we collected information, and by finding out about his role, we found out that he has really been involved in drafting these legislations, especially in Uganda. So for us, in 2009, 
uh, a reverend called Reverend Kapia Kaoma called me and told me there is a wave of extreme Christian evangelicals coming into Uganda. But even as a Ugandan Catholic, I did not understand exactly what extreme evangelical means. So this is to show you that the kind of language they brought in Uganda, we did not understand it because I attended the conference in 2009, sponsored by American evangelicals, and we're talking about homosexuals recruit children. You know, homosexuals are here to take away African values. Then some homosexuals turn and they become ex-gay. So all this was language that was brought in that we did not know. Now, if you go to Uganda at this moment, and you talk about LGBT rights, people will think you are crazy, because they will think you're talking about people who abuse children, you know, you're talking about um, people who are here to take away African cultures, and you're talking about a culture that is not Ugandan, because of that language that was mixed into our society. Yeah. Also, Ed, that it's... Uh um, the other, that, <coughs> that it's seen as a non-African value, that it's Western decadence? Um, because, again, of the language that has been brought into our own culture, and because it's accompanied by religion, and Uganda is very religious. So if a religious person speaks, no one is going to dispute them. Everyone is going to agree with them. So now homosexuality is seen so much as Western, more than being African and Ugandan. This infamous um, uh, anti-homosexuality bill has made headlines internationally. What's the situation now? Where does the bill stand? Um, the, the, bill, the anti-gay bill was um, brought into our parliament in 2009 and then uh, passed by our parliament um, last year, December, as a Christmas present, like they said. Then it was signed by the president um, um, in February, and then it was nullified because we petitioned, we worked with civil society groups in Uganda, uh, and my colleagues, other activists in Uganda, and we got the law nullified under our constitution. It was nullified on a technicality, but now what has happened is that in the last two weeks, members of parliament again have said they are going to bring up yet another anti-gay legislation, and again they are saying as a Christmas present. So, what do you think? Will it will the pass, or will it will it not? We are seeing it's a been a lot back and forth. Uh, we are seeing a problem that, as we strategize to fight these very anti-gay laws, to try and pro to do education in Uganda and change people's minds, that even the anti-gay groups are very strong. They are very strategically organized. They have a lot of support. You you, you go on a KLM flight to NTV, You'll, you'll be, trust me, you'll be on a, on a plane with people wearing T-shirts, let's go and reclaim. Let's go and, uh, you know, change, change the world. And all these are Christians going to Uganda. So the strategy they have used to come up with this uh, draft legislation is that they have changed the title. It's uh, called uh, Prohibition of Unnatural Sexual Practices. And I've made it very broad, whereby they talk about incest, pedophile, and then mix it up with homosexuality. So challenging it first is going to be very difficult, and then also standing up to such kind of a legislation from civil society that support us in Uganda is going to be very difficult. And also now, the international community that supported us in, in, in challenging the anti-gay law, it's going to be very difficult for them to come and challenge unnatural sexual practices being criminalized by a country like Uganda. So they have, been, they have been very careful in drafting up this legislation. That's going to be a very big challenge. And maybe finally, the challenge we are seeing now is that Uganda is moving into elections in 2016, and some politicians have made homosexuality an issue of popularity. So they are using it for their own campaigns. They're using it to cover up for things they have not been able to provide to Ugandans. And now Christmas time is a time when they are going to go to churches and ask for votes for re-election. So most of them will want to use this period, you know, to provide something. And what they can provide is an anti-gay law. Well, talking about politicians, this must also be a kind of a, a cheap issue. I mean, there is no service providing, there is no, no cost it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a cheap issue to try to, to gain popularity on. Yeah, exactly. And then also they don't have, you know, so many questions about it. All they can say is, I'm going to support the anti-gay law, and people support them. Mm.
And then you can hide your uh, your shortcomings on on other other issues. Yes, we've noticed that that whenever we, and we've tried some of our uh, international partners, development partners, that whenever a country, not only Uganda, whenever they bring up such laws, look at what is going on in the country, because sometimes they're trying to cover up for other things. Uh, but how has the bill and the process surrounding it uh, affected the situation for LGBT people when it comes to security and fundamental rights? When the, when the anti gay law in Uganda was in place, my organization documented uh, 164 cases of violations of people who were evicted, people who were um, verbally attacked or physically attacked, including people who were arrested. And for us, these are people who came to us. You know, we did not do a research. Because when the, when the law was passed, we wanted to do a demonstration and ask my colleagues, let us go and demonstrate. But then that would have been very dangerous. So producing this report and providing it to the government, to the law enforcers, was in a way demonstrating our being very unsatisfied with the law. Showing that when you pass this law, this is what happened to the people. When people were published in the newspapers, they were evicted. They were verbally attacked, they were physically attacked, they were arrests. So we provided these cases and we told the authorities that if you want to follow up on these cases, we can provide the individuals who were violated when this law was in place. But if the law will not be passed, what are the other obstacles uh, to human rights for sexual minorities in Uganda? Um, you know, right now we are fighting the law, but you know, the, the problem is a very long one. We have got a society that has been uh, indoctrinated by all these very conservative views. So changing the minds of the people. Yeah, but on the other hand, homosexuality has been forbidden by law in, in several African, in most all African countries. And that has been a long-term issue. Isn't that so? Yeah, it has been a long term because, uh, for example, in my country, however much they're trying to introduce another law, we already have a law that was left behind by the British colonialists. Mm -hmm. So I think the long-term challenge would be decriminalizing homosexuality, but that's a very, uh, very long road to go to. And you know, but having, having laws in place is actually limiting us, sensitizing and talking to the ordinary people, you know, trying to change their minds. Because changing the minds of the people, I can see it as the only long-term strategy to ending all this. Mm -hmm. Um, but in the wake of this proposed bill, there's been a lot of attention uh, um, around this issue and dialogue on the issue of, of sexual minorities. Has this increased openness and had any positive uh, consequences? Um, yes, there has been, if you look at Uganda right now, and Uganda six years ago, uh, however much, you know, media has reported that 96 of Ugandans are homophobic, they don't agree with homosexuality, but to be honest, Uganda has a vibrant young population of about 70% below the age of 35. There are very many people who are progressive in Uganda. But only that, the fear is now, it's more of a, a public problem than it is of a political problem. That people fear to speak out, even if they support, even if they are progressive. They fear to speak out, they fear what society will think of them if they support homosexuality. They fear if they are going to lose their own positions in society or their own jobs if they speak out. Before, six years ago, we didn't have any member of parliament supporting us. Right now, we have about two members of parliament, and one has said he's happy to lose his seat, but he'll continue supporting us. We've got some of the uh, um, Ugandan key celebrities who have spoken out and said they don't support this law, and they, they, they believe that every person should love anyone they love. So with the dialogue and the debate, you know, we have seen progress somewhere, but also we're seeing that our politicians are also taking us backwards. So there has been some positive consequences. Yes, there has been. So what about the long term? Could it be more positive consequences in the long term? Yes, I see that happening a lot. First of all, in my opinion, I think the dialogue and the debate causes more positive changes. Because people talk about the issue, and when people talk about the issue, they get engaged and they get to learn more. And also, because of the whole religious propaganda, there's been a lot of ignorance on, on LGBT rights. But now we've got um, you know, a global village. People read information on the internet. We can provide information on social media and Facebook. So also, there's positive information going out there. And then, because of that engagement, there are some people who have, have had to change their views on homosexuality. 
So social media has been a, a good thing for your cause, as Salil Shetty is talking about. How has it worked? Uh, social media has been one of our best tools to, to send out um, our, our messages and, and also in terms of campaigning and getting the international community involved and the regional community and also engaging some of our allies in Uganda. For instance, I engage so much with Ugandan journalists and Ugandan young people on Twitter a lot and some of them slowly by slowly they've been understanding my views and you know you debate once in a while but sometimes that you come to a consensus and they agree on, and they agree on something. How important has the support from, from abroad been? I mean, from, you are in uh, close connection with the, the Norwegian LAH uh, organization for gay and lesbians in, in Norway. Has that been important? Um, yes, uh, Norway has been very supportive. First, I received the Rafto Prize from uh, here, and I've done a lot of work with the Rafto Foundation in supporting my work, but also we've done a lot of work with LLH, uh, in partnership with um, with, uh, with, the, with the NORAD and the, the Minister of Foreign Affairs in supporting our campaigns in Uganda. And also, uh, one very important thing is that um, uh, Norway has supported the Civil Society Coalition on Human Rights and Constitutional Law, and this was very instrumental in challenging the um, Anti-Homosexuality Act in Uganda, but also in bringing together lots and lots of civil society groups the very first meeting was uh, to, to bring together uh, diplomats. When the law was first introduced way back, about five years ago, I got a call from one of the political officers from the Norwegian embassy, and we brought together different uh, diplomats and talked about the way forward. So uh, both the embassy in Uganda and, and, uh, and the government here has been very supportive in trying to see what kind of message can, can we use you know, to respond properly mm -hmm. to the situation in Uganda. It seems that many of the challenges you experience is, are connected to the la lack of knowledge and, and misconceptions. To change this picture, what areas are most urgent to deal with now? Um, what would be really very helpful is change the views of people. First of all, we need Ugandan voices. Because to be honest, if any external person comes in Uganda, they are quick, however important they are, they are quickly dismissed. Either they, they are homosexuals, or they will say, you know, you have your Western ideas, we don't agree with them. We need Ugandan key players. We have a journalist right so now. So you don't need so many foreigners coming and telling people that... We need them wrong. to partner, but on a low-key, on a low key, mm. you know, uh, silently. But we need Ugandan voices, we need Ugandan celebrities, uh, we need Ugandan religious leaders, uh, we need Ugandan uh, cele uh, um, j journalists and people in the media. We have a Ugandan journalist who has stood up all the time. He came with us to petition the AHA. And he talks about, because these are people in Uganda who talk about different views. We have Ugandans who were in the fight for HIV AIDS. If we can engage those ones and tell them you had this fight, but it's also a fight for human rights, engage them. And I know Norway has partnership with some churches in Uganda that are progressive. I understand some of them, they fear, they say this is an issue we can't cross. But I think engaging them and telling them get engaged on this issue, you know, on a very low key. You can start from um, families or homes and then the issue can come out uh, publicly slowly. When Kailash Satyarthi was here this morning, he was asked, uh, does the international framework help him in his work? What about you? Is the international framework, normative framework of human rights of any use? Uh, the international framework, of course, uh, is very helpful. And also I would say that our work in Uganda has majorly also been supported by the international community. Because like when I'm dialoguing with my, my, my government in Uganda, I tell them however much you do not want the international community to respond on issues of homosexuality, they will definitely respond. Because there are some individuals and there are some countries that hold human rights values very important. And for them, human rights values include LGBT rights at all international forums. So there are some people who are going to meet a Ugandan member of parliament and they will raise the issue of homosexuality. Recently, my president was traveling to uh, uh, the United States and he was denied accommodation in Texas by three hotels. And this was not because of any government. This was not because of any activist. This was not because of any human rights organization. But this was simply a business saying no. We can't accommodate you because of your stand on LGBT issues. Mm -hmm. well, so yeah. it's, it's... How did he react to that? 
His reaction was, I, the, he, his reaction was the business, they have their values. And he came back to Uganda and said, you know, the traders and the investors, they have their values. If someone wants to come and invest in Uganda, they can decide if they want to put their money there or not. You can't force them. You know, he, he said they have their values, so we have to be very careful with traders and investors because they can decide where to spend their money. So he, he, he turned it to his own yes. advantage. Yes. yes. Thank you very much, Mike Magisha. Thank you Thank so you much. Thank you, and I'm very happy to be here.